I mean, for me, it's a green flag when we can have conflict and develop deeper intimacy. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And now that I know how to do it, it's like, I know it's not my fault if this goes poorly. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Dear Shandy, listeners. Hello, Andy. Hello. How are you today? Doing okay. How are you? Very good. I'm very good because I'm very excited about the topic today and the guest in question. Because I've been wanting to tackle the topic of friendships, platonic friendships, for quite some time. You do talk about this a lot. (laughs) I, I really do talk about this a lot. But before we introduce our decorated guest, I will first read off some of her accolades. So our guest today is a New York Times bestselling author, professor, and psychologist. Her words have been featured in Psychology Today, Scientific American, The New York Times, Time, Business Insider, and Forbes, among many others. And she has studied friendship extensively, doing research on friendship all over the world. And she's the author of Platonic, How the Science of Attachment Can Help You Make and Keep Friends. We are thrilled to be joined by Dr. Marissa G. Franco. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That was a great introduction. Oh, thank you. Charlene's good at that. Uh, am I? I'm a little jet lagged, so I'm a little stumbly today, but thank you for saying that. So before we get going talking about the ins and outs of platonic friendships, a topic that I spend a lot of my time thinking about, I first wanted to ask you what you what inspired you to write the book? And then I have a two part question after this question. Yeah. So I would say I became really passionate about friendship. After I went through some breakups and I started this wellness group with my friends to kind of heal from that. And so we met met up every week to practice wellness. We cooked, we did yoga, we meditated. And it was really life-changing for me to just be around people I loved who loved me every week. And I will say the experience really made me begin to question some of the beliefs I had about romantic love that I thought was we're really amplifying my sense of grief, which was this idea that, you know, only romantic love makes you worthy. You only have love in your life if it's romantic. And I looked around at my friends and I was like, well, why doesn't this love matter? Why isn't this considered a legitimate form of love to have in your life? And so I just began to question a lot of our social messages where we were putting platonic love at the bottom of our hierarchy on love and pretending that it wasn't significant and was so trivial And I I really wanted to write platonic so that I could help others see friendship as sacred of a relationship as I had come to find it in my own life. Hmm. Mm. Wow, what a beautifully worded answer to that question. Tell she's a writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so two-part question to follow up. What was the most surprising fact that you learned about friendships in general while researching and writing this book? And then part two is... I'm just curious, just, you know, you share some personal anecdotes in the book and your own perspectives on friendships. What was the biggest thing you learned about yourself with friendships? Mm. The biggest thing I learned about myself was definitely in the chapter on uh, anger, where I approach conflict with friends like I need to just get over it and not bring it up. And that's what being a good friend is. And I would notice myself instead withdrawing as much as I wanted to get over it, I wouldn't, I would be withdrawing from, you know, one of my absolute closest friends. And to me, it was like, I felt stuck because I was like, well, I could bring this up and then we're all going to get angry and it's going to be like combat Mm. or I can not bring this up. And then I just sort of pull away and none of these feel good. So I came across the study that found that having open conflict in an empathic way is actually linked to deeper intimacy. And that made me rethink some of my beliefs that by swallowing this, I was improving the relationship somehow. And then reading from psychoanalyst Virginia Goldner, who talks about how you can have flaccid safety in your relationships, which is like, we feel close because we don't bring up any issues. Or you Mm -hmm. could have dynamic safety, which means we rupture and we repair, we rupture and we repair. Whenever we have an issue, we know that we can work on it together. So I wanted some dynamic safety in my life and I wanted that deeper level of intimacy and I didn't want to keep pulling away. And literally reading that science is what pulled me to address some issues that I was having with my best friend. And um, it was really good and it was really life-changing. And she started crying and she was like, never before did I know conflict could feel like this. And 
I too was like, yeah, like, and, and it's not just about having conflict, it's about how you have it. So I also had learned how to have conflict in a way that makes it feel like reconciliation instead of attack. Um, but now just knowing I can go forth in my friendships and I still struggle with it. Like it might take me a few months before I bring up the issue, but I know that I can and I always endeavor to at some point. Um, and seeing that that has ripple effects throughout my friendships, that other friends now bring up issues that they have instead of just literally living in misery, right? They'll leave a friendship interaction and feel bad because of a comment I made and I won't even know. Oh, until yeah. they tell me. And I'm so sad that, you know, my friends are, you know, experiencing this trigger and couldn't tell me. And we're just like, you know, surviving with that in the friendship. So it's, it's just very freeing and it's very liberating. And now I definitely find myself drawn to more relationships where we can have that level of honesty. Totally. It's, and yeah, yeah, it's so, so interesting. I find that people that I know, or I've known in my life are either super into conflict which is bad <laughs> or they are totally conflict averse mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you never like if everyone could just live in this happy medium of like conflict's not great i don't really embrace it but it's a good thing you gotta you gotta do it sometimes the, the whole world would be do. the whole world would be better there'd be no wars there'd be no there'd be no problems there'd be no friends that shouldn't be friends there'd be no lovers that shouldn't be lovers everyone would just be living in harmony no, all we have to do is just embrace conflict a little bit a little and, bit, you know, exactly. And I, I, and like I don't that. practice what my I don't practice <laughs> Actually, what I preach. No, I think you're pretty good about it, great. honestly. I I, I really related to a lot of your own anecdotes, just with how you, you know, approached friendships and and executed within them. Uh, and it is. I mean, I didn't mean to talk about this right away, but when we were talking about conflict, I guess it is a sign, you know, as to the long term compatibility. If you are not able to come out stronger with like a deeper intimacy on the other side of you broaching that, that very uncomfortable yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, it's a green flag when we can have conflict and develop deeper intimacy. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And now that I know how to do it, it's like, I know it's not my fault if this goes poorly. <laughs> I'm kidding, but. <laughs> yeah. Passive aggressive conflict resolution. That's the best kind. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to get that, an that first answer then. What was the most surprising fact? I know this is, I mean, the, it's, you have a whole book, so it's not easy to be like, what was There's the most so surprising, surprising fact? Facts. I know just if any come to, to mind right now, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, there is, I think, this general fact throughout the book, which is our negativity bias, which is mm. basically our brain remembers negative experiences and doesn't remember positive ones. So what that means is that when we're predicting the impact of our behaviors, we tend to be inaccurate and more cynical than the truth. And that really impedes our ability to connect and have intimacy. So for example, I talk about the liking gap. When strangers interact, they underestimate how liked they are by each other. I talk about this in the affection chapter, that when you show affection to people, you overestimate how awkward it is. You underestimate how much people appreciate it. Mm -hmm. We see this on research on reconnecting with friends. When we reach out to someone to reconnect, we underestimate just how much they'll value it. We think maybe they're mm -hmm. too busy or they've moved on with their lives. So across the board, we're like, kind of lousy predictors of our the impact of our social behavior. I mean, the issue with that is that if I think you don't want to hear from me or you don't like me, I'm not going to follow up and pursue a relationship with you. So it tends to foreclose our relationships because our brain have these biases. So I think it's really helpful to know because if we can develop more optimistic, more of an optimistic sense of hope about the impact of our behaviors and our friendships will be a lot more likely to engage in the behaviors that create and deepen connection. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then there's also less of that fear of rejection, which plays a part in this too, I think. Like if you assume exactly. the person doesn't like you, then you're like, oh, why bother? They're of not course, gonna wanna yeah. hang out with me. Okay, so we're now gonna start diving into our Shandies questions. We call our listeners our Shandies. And whenever we have a hot topic guest on like yourself, we always pull them for questions surrounding the topic. So this one being platonic friendships and our longtime listeners know that this is a topic that I just, I just can't get enough of. It's complicated for me, especially. I just have always, I don't know if I've always struggled in platonic friendships, but it just hasn't come as easily to me as romantic relationships, interestingly. And, you know, I know friends for whom it's the other way around. So 
You talk in chapter two about the power of attachment theory in friendship. What I wanted to know is, is it typical to have the same or different attachment styles in romantic versus platonic relationships? Mm. It can be different, but we, we tend to have a global attachment, which is a sense of our attachment style that is somewhat present across different relationships. But the reason it can be different is because if you think about friendship, right? It's so ambiguous. We don't know if someone likes us. They're not committing to us formally. There's no formal ceremony, right? Like we're trying to read these cues of how much they reach out to us as a gauge for how much they like us. And for some, well, we know that ambiguity triggers attachment because attachment is you projecting the past onto the present. And you can do that when it's ambiguous. When it's clear, then you have, you know, you know what the reality is. You don't need to use the path to try to make sense of it. So I think that's why the the sort of structure of the relationships being different is why sometimes your attachment style can be different depending on the relationship. I'll also say that sometimes I see and this is kind of a blending of this question, um, that romance tends to trigger attachment issues. And by romance, I mean, not sex, but feeling passionate about someone, thrilled by them, idealizing them. And that's something we experience in our friendships too. I think romance is part of friendship. It always has been throughout history, particularly amongst, you know, we see it amongst like very close female friends. They'll be like, you're my soulmate and she's the greatest thing ever. And I want to spend all my time with her. And those feelings of romance tend to be what I, what I've witnessed is like charged with attachment. So the relationships, whether platonic or marital that tend to feel more romantic can also bring out our attachment. It's all connected. Yeah. Okay. I'm so distracted thinking about all my friends now that oh. I don't reach out to. Oh, I mean, I got to say your book was, especially when you just laid out how you behave in certain scenarios and it's like secure, avoidant or anxious. And it was just interesting because when I have, you know, filled out these sort of quizzes or questionnaires yeah. relating to romantic relationships, it's usually been secure, secure, secure. And so that's why I asked this question. <laughs> I told you I was going to give you our Shandy's questions when I started with one of mine. But it, it was fascinating to me how it ran the gamut. Like some of my reactions would have been secure and some of them, a lot of them were avoidant. And then a couple of them were anxious. It's just really interesting. You start going through all your friendships. I know. you. It's really, of all the guests we've had, for some reason, this has made me reconsider my life more than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, like I said, we pulled our shanties and we like to pull the most common themes and, and ask you, you know, we're sort of the middleman here. And I think you will not be surprised to know that the overwhelming majority of the questions were how do I make new friends? I'm in an, a new city. I'm an introvert. I work remotely. And what's interesting not. about it is we have the luxury of being able to crowdsource really what's going on, what the zeitgeist of relationship mm -hmm. problems is amongst yeah. young people or any people. Yeah. And I find it interesting that there was such an overwhelming desperation of how do I make friends without seeming creepy, without okay. seeming creepy, <laughs> as, which, which outweighed the relationship, like the romantic relationship questions we get, mm -hmm. which are like, I've already, you know, I can have relationships and I've done it, they're not that great. And how do I make it better here? It's just like, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. It was just fascinating <laughs> to see how confused and helpless people and are in making friends as adults. No, and self-conscious. And self-conscious, Yeah, it right. really, it's so interesting how it came to this point of being like, how do I transition from like coffee date to real friend? Like, how do I do this without seeming creepy? It was really like more 101 yeah. questions yeah. than we typically get in the relationship sphere or the romantic relationship sphere. Yeah, and it was also really cute. It's like little kids. <laughs> It's like, how do I, you know, do I go finger paint with somebody? Like, what do I do? There is no difference. It yeah. was amazing. Okay. So what do they do? This is a, a big, big question. And I, I want to answer it with a story that's interspersed with research. Um, so I go to Mexico City, solo trip, 10 days. I'm like, I'm going to have to meet people because 10 days solo will be a little rough for me. I'm going to feel really lonely. So I know that I need to make friends. First piece of advice that I have for myself and for all of your listeners is that friendship does not happen organically. Do not wait to meet cute yourself into friendship. <laughs> People that think that it happens organically are more lonely over time. People that see it as taking effort are less lonely over time. Mm -hmm. So 
that's my first lesson. I'm in Mexico City. If I want to make friends, I can't just wait for it to happen. I don't know. We bump into each other and drop our coffees and then start chatting. That's not going to happen. So I am at a coffee shop and I hear someone speaking English with an American accent. Here's what I'm thinking. Transitioners are particularly open to friendship. That's travelers, people who have retired, people that have moved to a new city, you know, even people, transit moms transitioning to motherhood might want to become friends with other moms. So I hear another traveler, my radar goes up. They're a transitioner. They're looking to make friends, right? And so for you listeners, that could be other people that have moved to the city, which you could find on a meetup group or, you know, people that have just gotten out of a relationship. Um, those are the sort of people that are going to be particularly open to connection. So I know my chances are good with this other traveler. I also know from the research, like I said, the liking gap, people are less likely to reject me than I think, according to the research. There's another study that found that when people were asked to open up conversation with other commuters on a train, no one was turned down, not one person. So mm. I know that if I strike up conversation, although I might be scared that this person will think I'm weird, I hear that a lot, creepy, weird. In fact, people tend to really appreciate those overtures rather than thinking they're weird. That's part of our, our negativity right. bias. That's so, so interesting. Yeah. It's also much less difficult than in a romantic situation, but you don't have that sort of high stakes element and also yeah. that, that inappropriate element. Mm. Like you can be, you can be as inappropriately forward to try to friend someone as you want. You can't do it romantically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's definitely extra dynamics when that's at play. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I say hi to this guy at the coffee shop and we start chatting and I say, I was actually going to go to this meetup group later for like um, language exchange, Spanish and English. Do you want to join me? And so we exchange numbers and he joins me at the meetup. We meet more people. I simply ask like, oh, hey, I was actually planning on going to Lucha Libre, this wrestling match. Um, do you want to join me? And so he also is joining me. Clearly people that are at a meetup, like whenever you're pursuing a hobby and community with others, there's typically a secondary desire to connect, not just mm. to pursue the hobby. Yeah. Otherwise you pursue it alone. So if you're, you know, that's another piece of advice I have is to create repeated unplanned interaction and shared vulnerability, which means you're going to see people repeatedly over time in a setting where you can let your guard down. Mm. And that's according to sociologist Rebecca Adams allows us is what allows friendship to happen more organically. So, um, Knowing that, I joined the Spanish class where I'm going to see, you know, my classmates every day. So that's going to help with the friendship thing. And the reason that that really helps is because of something called the mere exposure effect, which is our tendency to like people who are familiar, right? This is based on research that when these researchers put these women into a psychology lecture at the end of the semester, none of the students remembered the woman, but they liked the woman who showed up for the most classes, 20% more than the woman that didn't show up for any. What? Wow. I mean, yeah. it makes sense. It's yeah, just so it interesting. Makes total sense. Yeah. So completely unconscious. So I'm just like, yeah, I have this class where I'm going to see people repeatedly over time. They're going to come to like me more. Um, so I end up asking people in the class, like, does anyone want to get lunch with me after class? And in doing so, I overcame something called covert avoidance. Sometimes we show up at the event, the networking, the hobby group, the interest group, which I do recommend joining something repeated over time to make friends. But once you do, you have to overcome something called covert avoidance. Covert avoidance is showing up physically, but checking out mentally. Mm -hmm. Like you're on your phone, like you're talking to the one person you know, like, you know, in the class break, mm -hmm. you're just like doing the exercises. You're not actually engaging with anyone. So for me, it looks like oh, hey, like, do you want to get coffee during our break? Or, you know, do you want to get lunch after class? Hi, my name's Marissa. How have you been enjoying things here? Showing interest in other people because according to a theory called the theory of inferred attraction, people like people they think like them. And yep. when we're insecure and scared, often we're, we're actually coming off like we're rejecting people because we become cold and withdrawn. And so we need to assume people like us so that we can be friendly and warm and make them feel accepted because that's what's going to make them invested in us. There's another theory called risk regulation theory, which is the idea that people decide how much to invest in relationships based on how likely they are to get rejected. So if you're showing people, I'm not going to reject you, I'm showing interest in you, I've overcome that covert avoidance, they're going to want to invest right back. Hmm. Hmm. 
So I will say by the Lucha Libre match, the wrestling match that Friday from my Spanish class, from the coffee shop, from the language event, there were eight of us going to this wrestling match together. I had, this was like five days into my trip. And I think people don't know it's that easy. Like you literally can just ask someone like, it's been so great getting to know you. I'd love to connect further. Could we exchange contact information? But it is. And I don't know, people think everyone has their friends, but if you look at the data, everybody's pretty lonely. They're just waiting for you, waiting for you to ask them. Oh, that's a nice way to look at it. So sweet. Yeah. And I think she's right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I mean, think people have it, they do the opposite of what they should be doing in making friends. Mm. They really think like almost like playing hard to get and being aloof is gonna make people wanna be your friend. <laughs> yeah. And actually I have a story that's eerily similar to yours. When I was I first moved to Germany, I spent a month in Berlin first taking German classes. And I met two British girlfriends of mine who were friends to this day, and I invited them both to our wedding in wow. those classes. And it was exactly what you're describing, this repeated unplanned, repeated unplanned, what is it? Interaction. Interaction and vulnerability. Yeah. And which often seems to be in a school setting, right? Like this sort of Yeah, that's school. why it happens more organically when we're kids. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. after a week of taking these German classes and I was going to be there for another week, but they were heading back to London and the two of them had each other. So I was kind of a third wheel and I felt a little awkward, but one day at lunch, they were talking about the restaurant they were going to try that night. And this is where I like, you know, stepped out of that. Just, you know, we're local friends in the German school setting. I was like, I really like you guys and I want to be your friend. So like, you know, if, if you're open having a third wheel, like I'd love to join you. I totally invited myself and they were really into it. And like I said, we're friends to this day. And it was, I guess, I don't know. I don't know if I would do that at home. Something about being in another place and yeah. you're sort of like, you're all there together doing this this thing. Like you said, mm -hmm. I guess you called it, it's like a transition period where you're all doing mm -hmm. this thing. Is that what you called it? Yeah, people in times of transition. People in times I of transition. That. That's yeah. like the sledgehammer approach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't very discreet, but you know what? It paid off for me, and I like to use yeah. it as an example of me and my... That's very cute. One of my more extroverted moments. That's cute. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really just you're a detective. If you're looking for new friends, you're a detective for commonality. Mm -hmm. Just like trying to seek it out. Like, who is similar to me? Who mm -hmm. Who is the same? Mm -hmm. And just find that person and engage. I do think it's a little easier when you're... And, you know, I'm not saying it's easier, but like you said, you were traveling, you were taking these classes. There's something about that where you're aware that you're all in that together. So do you have it's it's tough. I you you can disagree with me if you think I'm wrong, but do you think it is tough? I would think it's tougher when you're at home, you're in your home city, yeah. you're just going out. It's like, how do you find that bond, that thing that you're going to cling to? Yeah, I think we need to create that infrastructure for ourselves at home. And that looks like joining a group that's repeated over time. It can just be whatever your hobbies or interests are and pursuing them in community. Like if you like hiking or improv or language classes or painting or drawing or, you know, they even have walking groups now, whatever it is, just like committing to doing it in community. And I will also say, you know how I mentioned the mere exposure effect that we like people who are familiar what that means is that when people are unfamiliar, we're uncomfortable, we're weary, we don't trust. And that's part of the process. I think our issue is when we feel uncomfortable, when we put ourselves out there a little bit and we think that, oh, that's a sign this isn't working. No, that's part of the journey to finding belonging. Like you gotta stick it out a little for mere exposure effect to set in. Um, mm -hmm. I also recommend, so you know how I talked about starting this wellness group with my friends. I know some people who are like, I have kind of a sprinkling of different individuals. I don't really have a group. I don't know how to take it to the next level. What I did to create the wellness group, I went up to one friend, Heather, and said, hey, what do you think about this idea? And then we both brought in the rest of our friends. So it was less intimidating because mm -hmm. I had one other person with me. And since I've created so many different groups, when I was writing this book, I asked one friend who's also writing a book, do you want to do a writing critique group? We can each bring in one more person. Then you have a group, four people. It's repeated over time. Or we have a, a monthly dinner club where, you know, each person brings their friends and we we rotate figuring out a place to eat dinner. We had a monthly Spanish group called La Cena. So I think that the infrastructure is cool because when you create infrastructure where it's like already in your schedule that you're having this time to connect with people, 
you don't have to plan. You don't have to manage the logistics. You don't have to find a time in your schedule. You don't have to risk rejection over and over again by reaching out each time. So it's a great way to deepen your friendships, make them more meaningful, make them more regular and create a group identity or a watch party. A watch party is a great idea too. I know some people do that. Yeah. A lot of people do that. The bachelor. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just, yeah. Quick question. Would you identify as an introvert or an extrovert? Mm -hmm. Hard introvert. (laughs) Okay. So I think that's inspiring then. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, each each extroverts have skills when it comes to connection. Introverts have skills when it comes to connection. Like I can be a good listener. I love intimacy, one-on-one connections. I make people feel safe and comfortable. Extroverts, they bring the fun, right? The enthusiasm, the excitement, Mm -hmm. and there's no hierarchy here. Like each have different skills when it comes to connection. I think introverts, we get in our way when we think Introversion means social anxiety. When we think introversion means I can't reach out to anyone. When we think introversion means we can't put ourselves out there. That is not introversion. Like being able to initiate new relationships, that's a skill. That's not a personality characteristic. Mm -hmm. So no matter what your personality is, like you can work on building that skill and succeed at it. Oh, love that answer. Mm -hmm. Because I do think a lot of the shanties are intro. I mean, that came up a lot. It's like, I'm really introverted. What do I do? Okay, so... A favorite word that I learned reading your book was propinquity. Yeah. <laughs> you say propinquity means that you are likely to build relationships with people to whom you are consistently closer. You say it's proof that friendship isn't magical and is in fact overwhelmingly determined by the spaces we find or place ourselves in. So my question for you is, or our Shandy's question is, how do you stay invested in and maintain long distance relationships? Mm. So there is some research on this that, and this is a very secure way to invest in your long distance friendships. It is long distance friendships will ebb and flow. And the secure way to see it is that when it ebbs, it's not over, it's ebbing and it's going to flow again. The issue in long distance friendships is sometimes we think when there's a quiet season that the friendship is over and I can't reach out anymore, right? Mm. But being able to trust that, okay, there's going to be a quiet season. I can reach out at any time. We could reignite this friendship and engage with each other allows the friendship to have much more longevity than if you're fearing that, oh, if we don't talk every day like we always have, then the friendship is over. Mm. I think that's, I have that with some people. It's great. Like you just kind of pick up oh, yeah. where no, you that's left my... off, even if you haven't talked in two years. That's my favorite. Okay. Yeah. I have a, it's not on my list, but just based on what you just said, do you think that in some ways the accessibility that we all have to each other these days, these, these days, I don't know if it's ever going back. So this is the way it is now, but you know, there's, everyone is reachable now in, in such an easy way that it almost feels like. I'm less likely to reach out than when mm. it was harder to reach out. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I feel like the fact that I can FaceTime a friend on the other side of the world at any time almost makes me less likely to reach out to them because it, I don't know, it feels like I'm imposing. It, it decreases or, the value of the reaching out currency. Maybe. Mm. So I'm just curious if you agree with that or disagree or just have any thoughts at all. Yeah. Well, I definitely agree that we have a lot of access to each other. And so we, we have like this loose tie culture where we're just creating these huge networks of people who are kind of acquaintanceships. (laughs) Um, And it can be hard to feel like someone's elevated to the status of a friend in our life. Um, You know, I could, I could see your, I'm not sure like from a research perspective, but just speculating, I could see your point because I think sometimes because we can reach out over technology we can use that as a crutch and not be intentional. Like Mm. I, I, even when it comes to like friends, sometimes I'm keeping in touch with the friends who are on my social media platform, but those aren't necessarily the friends that I want to prioritize keeping in touch with. Like those two things are different. Who's most accessible versus who do I discern really wanting to stay in my life and wanting to invest in. So I think that's the, the tricky part when it comes to technology and also using that as a crutch since it's like, I don't know, sometimes technology is like, it gives us snacks of connection, but not a meal. But we are like, we have the snacks so we can keep subsisting on it. Like, mm-hmm. oh, we're reaching out over yeah. Instagram 
So the friendship is continuing and I don't have to go visit this friend now when knowing that, oh, if I visited this friend, I would feel so much closer to them and I would feel like I have the the entire meal of the friendship. So I think that can be tricky. And I think with technology, it just requires us to be intentional and discerning. Like what friendships do I want to keep? How do I want to keep these friendships alive? How do I want to reach out to them? Because if we're not, then our networks are going to be designed by our social media more than they are by ourselves. Oh, that's that's a good answer. I was considering, yeah, you, you acted like you didn't know the answer to yeah, that. Yeah, you really pulled that one out. <laughs> okay. I actually feel like I have a lot of friends that I don't think I would have if it weren't for technology. Mm. Like there are just people, it's so easy to maintain these kind of like just low, uh, low maintenance friendships. Yeah. yeah. And there's some people, and no offense, I, I hope that people are listening. They're like, wait a minute, am I Which one of those friends? <laughs> Jerk. No, but I, I really have these friends where I'm like, would I put the f- extra heavy lifting in, the real effort to have a real friendship where I'm like, hey, let's meet here and hang out for a few hours and talk about stuff. Or am I just having these friends where it's just the, this little like tiny drips of communication that maintain that friendship kind of indefinitely? And are those real friends? Or maybe did technology create this whole wider sphere of friendships that we should have that we didn't have because we didn't want to put the effort in? Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's always interesting to me or because maybe- I have all these people on text. I have like, if I go down my text messages, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm friends with that person. I'm like, yeah. am I friends with that person? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Kind of. We text. Yeah. Or conversely, you could argue that maybe that wider sphere of friends through social media, you were never really meant to have because you were never going to maintain those connections. Well, that's what I was kind of getting at, but I didn't want to say that because the friends friends are like, I know who I am, you jerk. (laughs) Okay. So next question, which came up from our shandies, but I have to admit, I also personally want to know the answer to this. How to maintain initiative and assume others like you when you feel like you're the one doing all the work at Mm. what point does taking initiative feel like your efforts are not being reciprocated Mm. oh man this is a question that i get a lot and i will say it's a question for something i i I created this term igniters which are um yeah so i teach these classes on loneliness two of these classes one of them, they literally send me a picture of like half the class out to lunch together. And they're like, oh, I thought you'd enjoy this. And I'm like, that's lovely. I love that they're making friends with each other through the class. The other class, I don't get any such pictures. Like they don't hang out outside of class. So I'm thinking about what is the difference between these two groups? And I think the difference is one person, the igniter in one of the classes who says to everyone in the class, anybody want to get lunch after class? The igniter creates the groups. Because an igniter exists, 15 more people in the class now have more friends because one person was willing to take that initiative. But the burden of the igniter is the not reciprocity. The burden of the igniter is everybody relies on the igniter and then is thinking that this happens organically, but not realizing that one person is actually putting a lot of work into this. Yeah, yes. that's so um, true. And you're not recognizing it. Um, and so that's really hard. And so I, you know, it's, it, it is very hard. And I have a couple of things to suggest. One is it's okay if you want to prioritize reciprocity as one of the vetting features of whether you become friends with someone, right? It's okay if you can say, I like this person, but I'm not getting that reciprocity. And so I think that I want to pursue a friendship with someone who does, right? It, it's going to require you to, to put yourself out there to more people, to find those people that give you that reciprocity. Your other options are, setting up something regular over time. So like, we'll just put this every first Monday of the month, we're going to hang out. So nobody has to reach out and it happens really automatically. I think you could also recognize that maybe it's not that there's not reciprocity, but the other person is on a different timeline. So maybe you were hoping you could hang out every week. They're hoping you could hang out every month. And so you could kind of wait and see if they have a different timeline. Mm-hmm. And then your last option is something I've done with with friends that I, I sometimes I think there's not reciprocity because the other person doesn't want to invest in the friendship at the level that you do. And sometimes it's just because they're not as good at taking initiative. So it's very confusing. This is why mm-hmm. friendship triggers insecure attachment style. Yeah. But for those friends where I'm sure that they love me and they're invested in me and they're just not showing that same level of reciprocity, I will say to them, you know, hey, I love when we connect you know, I noticed I've been the one to reach out the last couple of times and it would make me feel so loved if you were willing to reach out more. How does that sound for you? 
Ooh. And so, yeah. Ooh. That's direct. So what yeah. happens yeah. when you say that? Yeah, that person never speaks to you again. <laughs> that's it. But no, usually, I, no, I, no, I want to hear her answer. How do they yeah, react? Have you actually usually done that? They try, yeah, usually they try, but then it goes back to just like any sort of personality change, right? Like your New yeah. Year's resolution. You try yeah, for like, like two weeks. Bonk. Yeah, and so now I've come to like expect that. Like this is kind of how people work in their in terms of their personality. Um, but I like to go from igniter to delegator. Like that is my go-to. If people aren't, if it's a group and I'm the one who's always reaching out, how can we delegate and say, okay, do we want to switch off? Then maybe next month someone else can take over. Um, mm. Yeah. Igniter to delegator, which really works well within um, groups specifically. Mm. Yeah. What about the other way around? What if you're a friend who constantly feels like you're receiving a lot of ignition, I guess you call it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it seems like your friendships are good. Everyone seems happy, but you feel guilty. Like, how do you hold yourself accountable or do you need to change if you're just not giving enough and you're receiving too mm. much? If there is a too much receiving, I don't know. Well, it depends on like, do you like it? Like, do you actually want to pull away and have more time to yourself? Or do you just want to be a more accountable friend? Right? So if you're realizing that you tend to be more passive and your friends are probably putting in a lot more work than you are, first of all, you don't, you've done great by realizing that. Cause I think a lot of the times this dynamic is happening and the receiver is not even noticing, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we tend to have this responsibility bias when we're, we notice a lot more when we're putting in a, the work and notice a right. lot less when someone else is doing it. Makes um, sense. so just by recognizing it, that's really awesome. Um, and can lead to change because most people are just totally oblivious to this dynamic. And then I would say, you know, just like for behavior change in general, right? You have to just like put it on your calendar to actually do it. Or think about a time of day where you want to initiate. For me, it's like if I walk into my elevator, that's my time to respond to all my text messages, right? <laughs> Maybe it's on your commute. That's your time to realize you want to initiate with other people. Like what is a certain frame or setting mm -hmm. in your day that can trigger that reminder? Okay, it's time for me to initiate with these friends and reach out to these friends because we need that prime. We need that reminder to actually follow through on it. Uh, yeah. I want to wow. know how long your elevator ride is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you live on like floor. the 100th floor. <laughs> okay. Is it a slow elevator or a very high <laughs> floor? <a> slow elevator. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so this next question, actually, I was surprised it didn't come up with mm. our Shandus, so I just decided to ask you myself. So in the book, you, you have many example scenarios, and one in particular stood out to me. So you painted the scene with your friend Byron, who introduced you to your friend Lori. And the example was actually about forging a stronger connection with Lori and her being the proactive one. And it was the lesson was that it wasn't just going to happen. One of you had to be proactive. And thankfully, Lori was that person. But I couldn't help but focus on Byron in that situation <laughs> because I am often the Byron. So I have a pattern of introducing friends to each other and them bonding and becoming closer to each other than they are to me. And mm. it causes me to keep a lot of friends at a distance because I'm kind of protecting myself or, you know, I'm sure there's a lot to unpack there. Mm. So what advice, I'm like, Normally, I'm like speaking for the shandies. I feel self-conscious that I'm asking this question. <laughs> but what advice would you give for me for shedding this pattern or at least for caring less about feeling left out? Because I don't want to care about that. Like, mm -hmm. I, it, you know what I mean? It feels like it feels pathetic. Well, first, I think it's OK that you feel this way and it's normal. And um, yeah, I mean, we're such social creatures. We're We're all really sensitive to markers that like we don't belong. Um, mm. and so it is hard. And I think it is, I understand why you feel a little bit left out or a little bit hurt by the fact that this keeps happening. I want to say I have learned that to be very intentional about introducing friends, because sometimes there'll be a friend I don't know as well. And I will introduce them to a friend. I do know a lot better. And I'm not actually sure I want to continue to pursue this friendship that I don't with the person that I don't know as well. And then that person is still in my life because now they've gotten close to this person that I know better. <laughs> totally. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize we were going to hang out every week. Um, so I think before introducing friends, it's like, it's it just like pause for a moment and be like, okay, what could be the outcome here? Do I want this outcome? Like the, they could become very close friends and then I'm going to have to see both of them all the time. And do I want to see all of them with this level of frequency, right? And so when deciding whether to discern friends, I think that's really, really important. 
Um, I would, I mean, for like not caring, I feel like that's a hard question to answer. Cause I, I don't think, I don't think there's anything wrong with caring <laughs> <laughs> about it. I would just ask like, what, what's your understanding of why this pattern might be happening for you? Oh, me? Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Uh Oh, Uh Oh no, Didn't I don't expect wanna... that. Huh? <laughs> oh no, I'm going to cry. Oh. Um, well, I think it comes from a place of like what you just described. Like maybe I don't discern in advance enough. Like I'm more of like a more, the more the merrier person. And initially I take it as a compliment when they like each other because it feels like, oh, I have good taste in people. But then when they bond, I feel like, but wait a minute, you know, so it, like it starts out in this place of just wanting everyone to get along and be close. But then it sort of spirals out of control and it just has happened enough times where, you know, I'm not wild about it. Yeah, that's understandably hurtful. And I'm glad you're releasing your feelings about it oh, because <laughs> I think it's harder when you're trying to keep it in and be like, oh, I shouldn't feel this way. Um, and it, it's totally okay that you feel this way. And it means that you care about these people and you want to be included with them and that you, um, yeah, you want to find belonging and connection with them. So I guess my response is like, I don't think it's a problem that it upsets you. And I'm sorry that you've been going through this. Oh my God, you can tell she's a psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. I'll take over. Um, we got a lot of questions on the same theme about platonic friendships with someone you have a crush on. Hmm. And I guess the question is can you be friends with someone you're attracted to? How much flirting is okay in that <laughs> friendship? That was a big question. And can you maintain a friendship with that person at all? Oh, gosh, this question. <laughs> it's a hard question. Um, okay, so there's a lot of factors that play in here, right? Like, can this be a, a relationship? I, 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 I struggle for the terms because I think friendship is a relationship and I get annoyed that we we you know, monopolize the term relationship for something that's more spousal. But anyway, <laughs> um, can this become something more like a traditional romantic relationship or not? Right. Sometimes it's like that other person's like married other person, other times it's like you can, um, there's the potential for it. I think if there's the potential for it, what we know from the research on regret is people regret things that they don't do a lot more than things that they do. And I think that a lot of things can be worked through from talking about them. So I would say, better to like put your feelings out on the table and be like, Hey, you know, I would be interested in, in exploring this romantically, not saying being more than friends. Cause that also annoys me because that implies <laughs> that getting romantically involved means it's, a, you know, it's superior than be, to being platonically involved, but yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm interested in exploring this romantically. What, you know, what do you think? What are your feelings? Totally cool. If you're not on the same page, then I still just appreciate your friendship, right? Not nothing coercive, <laughs> um, right, right, right. putting yourself out on the table, but sometimes you're in situations where it's not possible. The other person is married. You were, you know, respect the marriage. I don't, I don't think you should tell them if they're married, um, for example, or in another relationship, or if it doesn't seem like they're interested or you tried and they, they show that they're not interested. And I think there's a beautiful thing about friendship and that is that it is on a spectrum. So I can keep you in my life at a lesser dose. I can keep you in my life at a higher dose. If you are romantically attracted, it may be that you need a certain dose to not feel just completely uncomfortable all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe we can hang out twice a month or hang out in groups or try to steer the friendship in that direction. But if you do, I think there is also a way to manage the uncomfortable feeling of wanting more. It's like you're like going into friendship, always hungry for something like you're literally perpetually hungry in a right. sort of emotional sense when you're attracted to this person. And that is to, to savor that hunger, like that. It, it doesn't have to be a means to an end, right? It doesn't have to be. Right. Yeah. Oh, I my couldn't attraction. agree more. Yeah. It has to manifest. It's beautiful to enjoy the thrill of attraction. It's like smelling a cake, right? Obviously yeah. you want to eat that cake, but the smell is also beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so I think also just finding the beauty of being enthralled and thrilled with someone, even if it doesn't bring you to a particular place is a beautiful end on it unto itself too. That is oh. fantastic. <laughs> I would applause, but I don't want to do that. Uh, we we <laughs> <can> applause. <laughs> So clap. Yeah. Well, we feel particularly validated by that answer because we've given that 
yeah. answer before. We Especially have. with like workplace romances that maybe, you know, are better left on Un- unrequited. Yeah, yeah. Or just unexplored at all. Unconsummated. I, yeah. I couldn't agree more with this. And I feel that I've had long term female friendships where I also savor that. It's one of the aspects of the friendship. It's mm-hmm. not like they have a totally lame personality. I just think they're hot. That's not yeah. like that at all. It's just like <laughs> one of the layers of our friendship is that I have this sort of nice little romantic feeling for you, especially when we're really connecting. And that's just something that I know I'm not going to consummate. Mm-hmm. I have no interest in threatening the friendship. But it's just like, as you said, it's like this beautiful smell of freshly baked cookies that yeah, I get to have I get to along with the smell the cookies all the time. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I just, I'm glad we talked about this. And honestly, it's pretty rare. Like, I feel like you don't yeah. always get that in your friendships. And I'm, I'm no. not saying that you should seek it out all the time because I think it would probably complicate. Oh yeah, no, no, I don't think you should seek it out. But when it happens, you should embrace it and not screw it up, which I have, by the way, I've also done that. I'm not (laughs) fair, but it was, it was a mistake, but you know, it's good while it lasted. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. So we're going to go in a different direction now because obviously the topic of ending friendships or friendships being toxic did come up with our shandies. What I want to know is, is there a best way to end a relationship that you feel is toxic to you? Well, I think first of all, your safety is really important. So if it's like toxic, like this is a little bit unsafe, then do what you need to do to be safe. But if it's a relationship where you don't fear for your safety and you just realize this dynamic is totally off and it's not working for you, I do suggest... And people are like, this is weird. But honestly, I think in general, I'm interested in disrupting boundaries between how we see our marital relationships and our friendships because intimacy is intimacy. And what works for creating intimacy in one relationship works for creating intimacy in the other. And you know, respecting someone, I think, when you're breaking up with them romantically is telling them and giving them closure, right? And I think the same thing for platonic love, that if you've been friends for a while, if it's not like a new friend where you can kind of just like, try to fizzle out and back away. And this person seems like they still want to be friends with you. The kindest thing that you can do is tell them directly, because if you don't give someone closure, you trigger something in them called ambiguous loss, which is when someone's grief process is disrupted because they don't have any reason or closure as to why the relationship ended. And that it's so hard for our brains to process uncertainty that like our brains continue to ruminate, trying to make sense. Why did this happen? Why did this happen? And so by you avoiding that conversation, it's almost like you end up asking another person to grieve twice instead Mm. of you facing that hard emotion. So, So, hmm. Were you going to, I was going to call you out on this and role play. Can I, can I, can I role play with you? Yeah. Yeah. Let's role play. All right. (laughs) Hey, Marissa, I, I just was reaching out. We haven't talked in a while. I really, I really miss you. I'd love to hang out. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much for reaching out. You know, I feel like I've been not the best at being transparent and, you know, I've just wanted to have this conversation with you that lately I've been feeling like we're not as compatible as friends anymore. Um, You know, I've been feeling like we've developed different values and are sort of evolving in different directions And I just want to make sure that you have my transparency that I don't think that this friendship will continue to work for me. Oh my God. That just took my breath away. (laughs) (laughs) Hold hold on a second. (laughs) I mean, I, that was, uh, yeah, I was, so we're not, are are we hanging out or not? (laughs) I mean, that is, that is very impressive. How often, like, have you ever done Ooh. that? Whoa, that's right. I, gotta, I, I need a stiff drink after that. <laughs> God, wow. I have not had to break up with a, fr- a close friend before, which is, I, I don't know, interesting. But yeah, it actually hasn't happened for me. But I have had other friends who have had that occur and have had, have obviously felt very hurt and very uncomfortable that a friend broke up with them. But they're a lot more hurt when they don't know what's going on for mm. a very long period of time. So it's like, there's no way to spare someone's feelings. There's only ways to like make it hurt less. And ironically, by being direct, you may, may feel like you hurt. It hurts a lot in this moment, but in the long term, it hurts less for the other person. Wow. Yeah. I will say with a surety, I will never do that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you end your friendship? Oh, absolute power fade. 
Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah the most cowardly route <laughs> you can imagine. Sounds healthy. Yeah. Andy, ambiguous loss. Think about their grieving. No, I think, I think the, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure I agree with you on this one. <laughs> That's yeah. okay. But I agree with everything else. Data driven, Andy. Data, data driven. No, I know. She's probably right. I just, it's hard for me to get in touch with her. Well, so what is better than a proper intentional friendship breakup or drifting apart? Is there ever a time where the latter is better? Yeah. If the other person's drifting too, then ah. it's like, it's a shared understanding. We're both less invested in this. Hmm. Um, even when the friendship is newer, I think I, I ask on my Instagram, if you're trying to make a new friend, would you prefer them telling you directly if they're not interested or just trying to fade away? I literally had a 50 50 split. Wow. So Ooh. it's a very hard question to answer because half people, according to my unofficial analysis, uh, you know, half the people want you to be direct. Other people would prefer the fade. So that's really tricky. But I think once you already have an established relationship, people much prefer being told than, um, you just fading away if they're still invested in that friendship with you. What, what about constantly saying you have a thing? Is, is, that, is that okay? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, maybe they'll get the hint, but you know, it, it's hard because I think mm. like, it's like when you're ghosting on someone, you it's partially because you don't understand the magnitude of your actions, right? Like mm. you're ghosting because you feel like, oh, in, in my brain, this makes it easier for you because it's easier for me, right? Mm. And that's why there's a disconnect because it feels almost kinder to just fade away because right. it feels more comfortable for us. And we sure. tend to project our own emotional experience onto other people. Yeah. But the receiving experience is very different than the giving experience. And I think that's what we need to remember when addressing these endings. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. I guess. I'm still shaking. No, I'm, so, I'm like, yeah. really sh yeah, like I'm I said, like I took my breath away. But <laughs> I guess, I and we have other questions here, but I just have to hover on this for another second because I feel like oftentimes there is a lack of self-awareness that causes me to not feel close with that person in the first place to the point where I would want to power fade on that friendship. And so you can't help but wonder how much they would even notice like if I feel like they should notice the power fade and read between the lines but it also stands to reason that they wouldn't because they weren't that present and engaged mm. and curious a friend to begin with do you know what I mean so it's sort of like the self-fulfilling yeah. prophecy where or, that kind of friend doesn't pick up on the signals and I mean anxiously attached people that's the sort of signals that make them more passionate about the friendship when you pull away they cling harder so, yeah. um, and yeah. maybe that they read the signals, but they just respond to the signals in a very particular way based on their attachment style. Ooh. Okay. So the moral of the story is Andy, it's never okay to, yeah. to do that. Unless never you pick up the phone. If you think the other person <laughs> might break up with your friendships. <laughs> okay. So I, there, I, what I liked about these next two questions is that they really represent, you know, I'm in my thirties. It really represents your thirties mm -hmm. and I don't know, Andy's older, so maybe it represents it even no, more. You, you tell me, you tell me. <laughs> it's a two-part question. How do you keep friendships alive when your lives start heading in vastly different directions? So let's say one of yeah. you chooses to have, gets married mm -hmm. and has kids, right. and the other one is like, no, I never want kids. And then, again, a two-part question, financial disparity when, mm -hmm. you know, you're kind of in a different socioeconomic class, and which can complicate things. Yeah, yeah I think with the different life stage thing, the hard part, I think, is that we we assume that being in different life stages means that we are inherently not able to connect, right? And that's not necessarily true. I think you, you, what I see when people have kids is that not only is obviously one person has a lot more to manage in their lives and that makes things more difficult, but also that the friend who doesn't have kids is sometimes like that person doesn't want to hang out with me anymore and doesn't want to see me. So there's this sort of mutual push pulling away that can happen when in fact, people might still want to see their friends and hang out with their friends and find ways, but they might need, what I tend to see is they might need you to be more flexible. Like you can come over after the kid comes to sleep. Um, so recognizing that, Hey, just because we're at different life stages, doesn't mean we need to disconnect. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we still show interest in each other's differing lives. We can be interested in each other's differences. So I want to hear about your kid. I want to hear how motherhood is going for you. Hopefully you want to hear about my, I don't know, my dating life or my hobbies or interests that I'm doing um, when I'm, you know, not hanging out with a kid that I don't have. Uh, so that mutual interest is really, really important so that we don't assume difference means disconnection. Right. Mm -hmm. 
I, you know, the word that comes up in my mind a lot with this is that assuming the assumption, yeah. the assumption people won't like you, the assumption yeah. that yeah, that people are busy, talk. they don't want to hang out anymore. Yeah, or the assumption that people like you in certain situations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, assuming you know what they say about mm. it. Okay. We're oh, gonna... I'm sorry for the financial differences. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's helpful to just put that out on the table very directly. And I think our our issues with putting things on the table is that we're a very sensitive species. We think we're being rejected when we're not. So whenever you're putting something on the table, just also adding a lot of affirmation um, so that you show that this is not a sign that I'm rejecting you. So you can just sort of be like, Hey, I would totally love to hang out with you. I love the time we spend together and I'm finding myself on an increasing budget. Like, would you be willing to be flexible and hang out in these ways? I don't know, walks at the park, hikes together, come over for some coffee. Like, would that be something that would work for you? Hmm. That's nice. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> okay, so final question before we set you free. I mean, you give such great answers. I could go on yeah. forever. I have some extra questions, but I feel like we're nearing the hour mark. You know so. what you should do? You should be like, remember that stupid book, The Game? Oh, yeah. You should do, oh, you my You should God. do friendship game, like where you just go out to bars with people who can't make friends. And you're just <laughs> like, hey. That's awesome. Yeah, that would be really cool. <laughs> uh, I'm not even kidding. Because no, actually, I, I wasn't going to ask you, but I even said, could you give a script because I think some people really need that. The script of like, okay, we've met in this social setting, but I feel so awkward. I feel creepy, weird to use those other words. Yeah. How, what's the script for being like, I want to take this to the next yeah. level? Th yeah. this, is, this is the best idea I've had this week. Just so you know. I don't <laughs> have a, a lot good of good idea. ones. It's yeah. A, yeah, it's a high bar for ideas. Um, just saying, hey, it's been so great to talk to you. I'd love to stay connected. Would you be open to exchanging contact information? Yeah. She makes it sound so easy. Oh, that's it? That's not fun. <laughs> okay, believe it or not, that actually wasn't my last question. This is my last question, which is kind of a weird question to end on. I, it just really stuck out to me. I thought mm. it, it was a Shandy's question. So they say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But is there a limit? How should you respond when a friend constantly copies you? Mm. Oh, what is going on? This is <laughs> Charlotte has bad like friends. This. No, this isn't, <laughs> no, this is a shandy She's question. Asking for but friends. I mean, I got to say, I chose it because it, uh, oh, it, it spoke to me. Autobiographical nature. Yeah. I guess I would wonder, because I literally have never been asked this question. So I'm thinking out loud. Like, does this reflect a larger dynamic where this friend doesn't have a sense of self in the friendship, right? Where this friend is more so trying to be whoever it seems like they think I will want them to be. Hmm. Oh. Um, and oh, is there an sad. issue with like authenticity in this friendship in general? Like, do I feel like this person is people pleasing over complying to get me to like them? Or do I feel like I really know them as a person? And so I feel like if we're able to like unlock each other's authenticity and show people that it's safe for them to be who they are, because people like tend to conform and be kind of inauthentic because they don't feel safe. So mm -hmm. how can we make this person feel safer and help them understand that they're going to be loved in whatever form that they come in? And again, as your friend, there's limits to the extent that which you can do this, right? Like people have other deep seated stuff that has happened before you. This might be a journey that they go on with their therapist, right? But there are certain things you can do to feel safe by showing interest in them, asking them questions about themselves, asking them what they like to do when they share their own perceptions and experiences, validating them like, oh, that's so cool that you love this and this and this. Tell me more about it. Like, that's so understandable. Showing interest in who they are as mm -hmm. a person um, to create that sense of safety so that you can see their truest self. You sound like an amazing friend. Yeah. <laughs> can we be your friend? You. Can, can we be your friend? Uh, how, can we exchange I want to be your friend. This? Is this good? Am I doing a good job? Oh, you want you yeah, wanting to be job. my friend, right? <laughs> Dr. Marissa G. Franco, my goodness, what a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us Thank and for you. your fantastic yeah, answers. This is great. Yes. And and yeah, we're gonna we're gonna debrief it and talk about you, but it's all gonna be yeah. positive. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye. Have Bye. a good day. Bye. Take Bye -bye. Care. Oh man. Oof. That was intense. She was amazing. Yeah. Wow. What a great answer she gives. She gave good answers to everything. Even when she was like, I don't know. Yeah, she did know. <laughs> <laughs> she lied. She did know. She lied blatantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, on, on the surface, some of it's like, it's 
you know, it would seem quote some, unquote obvious, yes, which is that like, it. oh, treat others with respect, how you want to be treated. And also, if you're in a new place, find people who have similarities yeah, or, yeah, you know, yeah. approach them and whatever. But, yeah. But, but this other stuff, wow. Oh, yeah. I, what I really liked was the assumption bit. You know, we touched on that, but the assuming that people don't want to hang out with you, don't like yeah. you, all this stuff. That resonated with me too, because I totally do that. Yeah. There's sometimes t- people I haven't talked to in a while and they're like, oh, they don't want to hear from me. Yeah. I always assume that, in fact. Oh, my God. That's horrible. (laughs) What kind of life is that? Yeah. And, you know, when I think I've got a couple of friends that come to mind who I think are excellent at what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, she said she has that moment where she goes in the elevator. That's her time to catch up on text. Like, it's almost like this is clocked into her schedule. And. I'm, I've always admired that about them, how, you know, every six months, like, it's not like we ever see each other. They're, they don't live in New York City, but like every six months I'll get a text, like just checking in. And I always think I should be more like that. Yeah, I know. Me too. Let's be more like that. <laughs> yeah. I feel inspired. Yeah. After me reading too. her book, I really do feel inspired. Me too. And it really faced me with... Uh, some habits I have in friendships that I didn't think I had. That was like a really roundabout way of just saying that I learned something about myself. (laughs) But like I said, in romantic relationships, I do think I have a secure attachment style. And that's why I asked her if there was often a difference. Yeah. Because I actually think I'm meant to have a secure attachment style in friendships, but I've like, I can't even pinpoint from therapy when these things like went awry for Mm -hmm, me. And mm -hmm. because of that, it's like I've developed not a full blown avoidant attachment style, but like a semi. Yeah. Like I'm constantly, you know, she touched on reciprocity. Mm -hmm, I'm mm -hmm. constantly gauging reciprocity. And she said avoidance are also more likely to end friendships. And I like, I feel like as I become more avoidant, that's also more likely to happen. It's, it's interesting. It, it really is. And you know what's so interesting? We talk about romantic relationships all the time on this podcast, yeah. this relationship podcast. But I think when it really comes down to it, I think romantic relationships are a lot more simple than friend relationships because romantic relationships are driven primarily by hormones. <laughs> I mean, that's the element that makes them romantic, correct? Yeah, there's a lot more reading between lines, I feel like. Because, you know, the thing about romantic relationships is that, let's say it is your forever relationship. Sure. Like, you and I don't need to read between lines with each other at this point in our really at that much anyway. You know, we're pretty okay with just telling each other how we feel. But it's not like you really reach that point necessarily with platonic friendships. Right. Like, if you're not going to have a blowout fight in a platonic friendship that you will in a romantic True. relationship. You right. know what I mean? It's just, there's a lot more nuance. Yeah. There's a lot more just fine strokes in friendships. Fine strokes. God, we're such complicated, fragile social I know, creatures. We're so I pathetic. mean, dogs, like literally they go to a dog run, they sniff each other's okay. butt, they wrestle <laughs> and they're friends for life. That's yeah. it. Yeah. We're just like, Oh, everything. So complicated. Yeah. We have to talk about the role play. Oof. That was I'm really still recovering. <laughs> yeah. I I literally want to be her friend just to like (laughs) exercise the demons of that conversation (laughs) and then break up with her to get revenge. Really healthy sounding. Ambiguous loss. I have a friend who it was actually with a romantic situation, but she called it an energetic leak when Mm. it ghosting happened and she didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it's all one and the same. You ambiguous loss. It really can haunt a person. Yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, also very concise loss can haunt them too. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Were you more traumatized by her breaking up with you? Than I mean, you put it this way. I don't know how other people would react to that, but if that happened to me, I may reconsider becoming friends with anybody else ever again. <laughs> <laughs> I think what made it hurt extra was, you know, if it's a breakup, if it's a romantic breakup. Yeah, but then there's a thing. There's a hormone element to it. Yeah, there's just It's like, some... I want to have sex with other people. I'm a human. And that happens. Deal with it. Yeah. And if you think about it, when you break up with someone, you're like, but let's be friends. In this case, it's like, I don't even want to be your I don't, friend. Yeah. <laughs> let's not be friends. Let's not have sex. Let's not be friends. Don't call me. <laughs> I want nothing don't to do with me. you. Yeah. Don't text me. If you see me, cross the street. Yeah. I mean, That's brutal. There's nothing left. <laughs> There's nothing left. You're basically saying, I want to live the rest of my life and die having no interaction with you. I want to unknow you. 
Wow, that is brutal. It's way worse than breaking up with a romantic partner. It's like a joke. Like a romantic breakup is a joke compared to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can see why she says you should do that, but holy shit. You couldn't pay me any amount of money to do that to somebody, even if I hated them. Nothing. I'd rather die. We're supposed to talk about how we're changed by this no, conversation. You're, that's the inspired. one part. I'm just, I refuse to bend on that. It's traumatizing. Oh, oh. I, I meant to, I swear I meant to rap, but there was one other thing that she mentioned the question about, well, my question about the pattern of like introducing people. I never really thought of that. In fact, my mother has given me this advice, but I was like, I'm not taking advice from my mother. <laughs> and she was like, you should think twice about who you introduce to each other. Mm. And that's what she said. She did say that. And I've always been like, but that's a behavioral thing. Like they should see that situation. No, different. Job. They it's, should read that different. Like I put it on them, but it's no. actually on me yeah. to it, on the onset before even introducing them thinking long-term. Right. And that. you can't be upset about the outcome if you're the one who orchestrated it. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. Well, if you are interested, the book is platonic. How the science of attachment can help you make and keep friends. Highly recommend. And I think that's a wrap, Andy. Yeah. If you enjoyed what you heard today, you know what we will ask of you. And that is to like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, follow us on Instagram, tell your friends, leave us Apple and Spotify podcast ratings and reviews. Oh, also follow us on TikTok. No, yeah, it's like my thunder. Sorry. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Dear Shandy. Bye-bye.